we'll get to go about our business. Okay. Now, one of the things about this YouTube module is that you will start to see a lot of things come back. There are a lot of aspects of YouTube that are similar in various ways to Facebook or Amazon or Google. So again, in a sense, this is like kind of your do-over chance, right? If you didn't fully absorb these things first time around, well, guess what? Life repeats, and this is one of those cases. So let's go ahead and get started here. Topic is quality of service. So what we'll talk about is typical problems, some measurement issues, how you decide whether you actually have good or bad quality of service, and then how what YouTube does in order to manage that. Okay, and then we'll talk eventually about some of the stuff that uh, YouTube does in the cloud. Okay, but I guess not really this lecture, so I don't know how that slipped in there. All right, we'll talk. Well, that's uh, actually from another lecture. Okay, editing mistake. Anyway, so you all know YouTube. You've grown up with it, I'm sure. All right, it's been around since 2005. Perhaps there are a few older people in the room that, you know, distantly remember a time before YouTube. I think I became aware of it like in 2007 or so, and I went and told one of uh, my fellow grad students, hey, I just found this cool site called YouTube. You can watch like old music videos on there. And he's like, yeah, I already know. Okay, well, you got that kind of free time. Anyway, so yeah, it's been around for a while and everybody knows about it. Uh, it gets most of its revenue from advertising. Up until a few years ago, Google was super secretive about all this stuff. You couldn't even find uh, details online about whether YouTube was running a profit or not. But now it's easier. There, you know, there's, there's stuff out there and you can kind of figure out what's going on with it. So, uh, but of course the big model, they have always used a lot of advertising. You know, they run ads along with the videos, which again, if you've been there, you know. But there's also some cases with paywalls and subscriptions like YouTube Premium. You can opt out of uh, seeing commercials. And, you know, you can rent or buy videos through YouTube. Uh, the example I did this morning was Pinocchio, which, you know, the old 1941. You could rent it for uh, $3.99 or buy it for $19.99. So anyway, all that kind of standard streaming stuff. Now, it is a very big website. This is some kind of trivia, so not super important to memorize this. According to some measures, YouTube is the number two website in terms of visits, which is a lot. Okay, but I guess in the end, it doesn't really matter for IDS 200, whether it's number two or number five or number 10. The point is it's really big, right? 37% uh, of worldwide mobile traffic. I've seen some slightly different numbers like 35%, but however you slice it, it's a lot, right? There's a lot of people using mobile devices to pull their data from YouTube. Uh, their current repository of videos, about a billion. The number I've seen lately is uh, 800 million, but I know they they must have pruned a lot or people deleted theirs or something because a few years ago it was more than a billion. So I'm not sure where, you know, what happened to all those other ones. Uh, but anyway, roughly a billion videos posted and again, always growing. So if you're looking to find out some more information, uh, this facts.net article has a bunch of factoids about YouTube and their deeper meaning if there's some text along with that. And then this YouTube statistics link is pretty much, you know, again, just factoids. So key takeaway from this, YouTube shows videos and it's really big. Okay. Now, next thing, quality of service. So quality of service is a term that's generally applied to network systems and applications. And roughly it means how well the system is working, particularly the networked aspect of it. Okay, so whatever you're doing as a client interacting with some server, basically if you're happy with how fast and reliably the server delivers data to you, you have good quality of service. If not, quality of service not so good okay but just like big data because of there's always case specific details it's kind of also a catch-all buzz phrase you know we say well our organization is really concerned about quality of service or we're deeply committed to bringing the best quality of service in North America right and again there's different factors there at play just like with big data so for example typical user preferences for applications if you're sending an email you know, an email is generally not the thing that's super urgent, right? If it gets there in like five seconds or 30 seconds or a minute or two, most of the time that's totally fine, right? It's not super urgent like if you're playing some real-time video game. So in that sense, reliability is super important. You want to make sure that A, the video eventually gets there, and B, when it does get there, it's complete, right? So if there's a, an email with a big file attachment, 
you want to make sure that the file attachment gets there in total, right? And not that there's uh, some piece missing and the file is useless. And you would trade reliability for speed in that sense. If that means that you got to wait a few extra seconds to get your email, so be it. Uh, for images, suppose you're uploading an image to something like Facebook. Generally, it's more important that the image quality is correct, right? So whatever image you upload, it's delivered at the same or better resolution than what you had it in. There's no like random spots in it like fireflies. And if that requires taking a little bit of extra time and care to make sure it gets there and is complete, again, so be it, right? Because if you're posting pictures of your vacation up on Facebook, you'd like the pictures to actually look like they should look. On the other hand, for video, speed and reliability tend to be more important than some minor data loss. So when I say reliability here, even there, I mean something a little different. So speed, you want to keep the data arriving quickly, right? You don't want interruptions in the stream where the video just says, oh, I got nothing else to play. I'm going to have to stop playing the video for a while. And I'm going to wait for the next batch of data and then start again like five or 10 seconds later. That sort of interrupting start and stop video play is really super annoying when it happens. And if that means in order to keep the video playing continuously, there's a little bit of data loss. For example, you don't maintain quite as high of a frame rate or you deliver uh, images in the frames in a, less, uh, in a lower resolution or something. They look a little blocky for a while. That's probably better than that start and stop video play. So again, in general, quality of service means how well the system is working. It's typically focused on things like how much data you can push through the cables per unit time and how likely it is that everything arrives, you know, within a reasonable time. That's what we mean by quality of service generally, but there's a lot of different aspects to it for specific applications. Okay, now, a video stream is basically a set of packet transmissions with a specified order, right? So however YouTube takes this video, it's gonna, it's a big file that YouTube has, they're gonna break it into packets, they're gonna send those packets in order over the internet to get to you. Right, and each one of those packets, depending on the nature of the video, it might be a part of a video frame, or if there's some sort of simplified uh, version that allows video compression effectively, the single packet might actually include data about a whole bunch of frames. So one example is, for example, if you're showing a blank screen, you know, it's all black or all white, whatever, and that just stays there for like five seconds, all you have to do is do some kind of vector description of fill this box with a particular color and just repeat that frame 200 times. And that you could easily pack into one packet, right? But on the other hand, if it's fairly detailed information where you need to send along every pixel in a large image, yeah, you're not gonna fit that in uh, 1.5 kilobytes. So it kind of depends. Anyway, once all the packets arrive, right? Once you get them all, your browser can combine them into a video file and play it on your machine. Hooray, and you can view the complete video. Now, if you had high quality of service, right, which is what you want, if you had high quality of service, basically the user could view this video stream about as well as a locally stored video on your own disk, right? So if you had the video stored there on your own disk or running, you know, on a DVD player or something, yeah, it would be about the same. But there's a few problems about that. Number one, if you're waiting for the entire video to download and it's a big video, like a couple gigs, that's gonna be a couple minutes, right? And nobody really wants to wait that long. So that's unfortunate, but yeah, waiting for the entire video to download would be slow. So instead of downloading the entire file, YouTube downloads chunks of file. Well, you, you would download chunks of the file from YouTube and eventually play them. But as long as those chunks are arriving fast enough that the video can play continuously, we could solve that quality of service problem. But there are other problems about reliability. What happens if frames arrive out of order? Well, then you gotta wait, right? If YouTube sends you some chunk of the file and for some reason it arrives out of order, you don't have it, you have the rest of the file, but that one chunk arrives late, well, you gotta wait for it to show up before you can play the video. So it's important that YouTube delivers those chunks in sequence. Second, what if a few frames arrive very late or never? What if there's some failure in the delivery process and you never get those frames. Well, it's possible that your video application could just kind of skip over that, say, yeah, we have this little window in the file, we don't have any data, oops, you know, but nobody really wants that. Most of the time, uh, the way the files are structured is that you have to have all the data there in place in order to show any of it. And so, yeah, that, that could be a problem too. So, all right, so we'll talk eventually about how YouTube solves some of those problems. But first, Typical quality of service problem. 
So number one, slow video starts, right? If you download a whole bunch of video data right off the bat, it's gonna take a little while and it's gonna be a while before the video can start playing. So you can decide as a video playing application, do I need a little bit of the video to start playing or do I have to wait for a really big chunk, right? In general, people would like to start watching the video right away, pretty much as soon as you click on it. Second, choppiness, right? Choppy video play, nobody likes that. If there's a lot of starts and stops while it's playing, you'd like to avoid that if all possible, right? If YouTube's video play was choppy like that, people would go just about anywhere else because that sucks. Uh, and finally, bad quality, missing or corrupted pixels or frames, something is just displaying wrong in the video. So those are the things that YouTube needs to watch out for. And interestingly, they tend to all have the same root cause. And the root cause, too much traffic relative to capacity. So the technical term for that is network congestion. And that just means on all the cables and all the other equipment that, net, uh, that YouTube has, there's only so much capacity. There's only so much data they can send over it per unit time. And if there are a lot of users requesting data, everything's gonna slow down. So we'll talk more about that too. But as a uh, way of thinking about it, the total network traffic is basically the number of users times the number of apps times the data used per app. So if you double the number of users, you're probably gonna double your data requirements. If you double the number of apps that users are using, right? you could very well double the uh, amount of data required. And of course that depends. If you're watching video streaming or like Zoom or something that's fairly demanding, then that's gonna be a lot more data than if you're interacting with an Excel file in the cloud somewhere or you know Microsoft Word, which is gonna be fairly low intensity. Uh, but then the amount of data per app, that's it right there. Okay, so as the platforms get more ambitious and they want to allow more users to do more things at the same time, then that's all becoming an issue too. I mean, once upon a time, a web browser was just, you know, a web browser and you didn't even have multiple tabs as a thing. You just had the one web browser application and you did whatever you did on that page and, you know, you had one connection at a time. Now we can have multiple tabs and each of the tabs can have multiple separate application connections. And so again, just that one browser application can be doing a whole lot more stuff. Not necessarily on YouTube, but a whole lot more stuff. Anyway, when network traffic exceeds the system's capacity at any point, there's got to be a delay. If you have a cable that can only send over one gigabit per second, and the total amount of data that people are requesting through that cable is like six gigabits per second, you're not going to be able to fulfill that, right? It's basically the uh, network equivalent of a traffic jam, and somehow somebody's got to wait. You might designate one subset of users, high priority ones, you say, you know what? We're gonna give you all the data you're asking for. Everybody else has gotta wait. You might say, we're going to give everybody a fraction of what's available. Everybody gets something, but nobody's gonna get their full data rate. And so everything's gonna happen slower. File downloads, page loads are gonna take like six times as long. You know, or you might blend those two. You might give a few users something and like greatly degrade the performance of all the others. But somehow, if there's a bigger demand than you have capacity to handle, there's gonna be some kind of delay somehow. All right, now we're going to go in to a little intro of some technical stuff. You don't really need to memorize what I'm gonna tell you, not really gonna be directly on the exam. I'll, I'll tell you what the key takeaways are for this afterward, but this is actually important because Thanksgiving is coming up. Is anyone planning on seeing any of their uh, unusual family over Thanksgiving, right? Like if you live with your parents, of course you're gonna see them, but aunts, uncles, grandparents, cousins, yeah, some people, yeah. All right, is anyone going to be spending Thanksgiving with people who are financially contributing to your education here at UIC? Yeah, all right, so you know what's gonna happen then, right? They're gonna, at some point in the dinner, they're gonna say, oh, so what are you learning at UIC? What, are, what am I getting for my money down there? And it'd be nice to have a really good answer, right? So I'm gonna give you a really good answer. All right, so this is basically what's in the slides. Okay, so suppose you have three mobile devices, A, B, and R. And R is easy to remember because R is the receiver. A and B are both trying to transmit to R at the same time, okay? And the arc that A can reach, 
when they're transmitting to R is going to look like this. Something like that. And the arc, whoa, yeah. The arc that B can transmit to, holy shit, is going to look something like this. Okay, everybody with me? So you got two devices. Now, what do we notice here? We notice that A and B are out of their mutual communication range, right? A and B can't directly coordinate to say, hey, you wait, I got to talk to R, you wait a second, right? This is what is known as the hidden node problem. Okay, A and B can communicate with R, but not each other. Okay, this is our this is our scenario, and it's a fairly common thing in mobile networks. So, how do they do it? Well, how do they arrange it? There is a handshake involved, basically a four-step handshake, where Suppose A is going to try to transmit to R, right? Step one, A sends an RTS packet request to send to R, okay? If R is available, R will return a CTS clear to send packet to A, okay? Otherwise, R will do nothing regarding A, okay? So if A gets the clear to send packet, it can immediately begin sending whatever data it was going to, okay? Whatever it was gonna send to R, it's just gonna send whatever it's going to send to R because it knows that R is ready to receive it. Otherwise, a will wait a random delay before trying again, okay? And then afterwards, you know, the fourth step, R says, thanks for data, right? Basically sends confirmation. So you're like, hey, there's only three steps in there. Well, the fourth, fourth step is, Whenever R is, you know, gets the complete data stream, whatever is being sent, individual packets, or sometimes a sequence of packets, at the end, R will confirm, yup, I got it. Okay? So this is your basic four-step handshake kind of situation. Now, this is the key part here, and I'm going to highlight it in blue. This part. Wait a random delay. Because remember, this is about Thanksgiving. This isn't what's going to be on the exam. So, the delay is called a back off. Okay, because you were going to do something, but you can't, so you back off. So it's called a back off. And the random delay doubles with each attempt, with each failed attempt, really. And what would we call, what would we call something that doubles over and over and over? What kind of function would that be? What? It is an exponential, isn't it? And because it multiplies by two every time, it's known as a binary exponential. Very good. It's called a binary exponential. And the algorithm is the binary exponential backoff algorithm. All right, so I'm going to stretch this out so you can actually see everything. Or binary exponential backoff. Okay, now remember, this is about Thanksgiving, right? So when you are sitting at the table with grandma and she asks, what are you learning at UIC? You can respond, well, just last week in my intro uh, management information systems, we learned about the hidden node problem and the binary exponential backoff algorithm. And that ought to shut grandma down right there, right? Grandma's gonna be totally intimidated. Grandma can barely tell if she's getting fished or not, okay? But 
suppose there's somebody at the table who has a tech background. Maybe your grandma has a tech background. I don't know. And she says, oh, wow, that's really interesting. I remember when I used to work on those kind of mobile ad hoc networks and we had to deal with the hidden node problem. Why don't you refresh my memory on what the binary exponential backoff algorithm is? And if you know this, ta-da. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's what I'm saying. This is this is good Thanksgiving conversation. Again, the vast majority of people, you know, they'll, they'll just stop. I, I remember there was, uh, when I was doing my dissertation, what, I finished it like in 2011, somewhere around there, a couple years before, uh, my very old Aunt Mary sent me, uh, you know, asked, oh, I wonder what Doug is doing in grad school. And so I wrote up a little five page thing with pictures and stuff like this. And I explained it to my very elderly aunt, and she was uh, very happy that she could pretty much understand what I was talking about. I mean, she's not going to do the algorithms and the coding and the full network stack and all that, but she understood the basics of the research. So, yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, I did seven years, but there's some, uh, I didn't have a master's going in, so I had to do like a couple years of coursework on that. And then I got involved in this uh, fellowship thing that uh, also added on like another about a year and a half of co coursework. But the direct answer, about seven years. But I did a PhD and a master's and some other stuff all in that bundle. Yeah. Yep. All righty. Anyway, so there's that. Questions on this? Would you like to know more? This is plenty, right? All right. So. Here's the takeaway. So number one, if you have two devices that are both transmitting at the same time, what's going to happen is that uh, those electromagnetic pulses are going to interfere with each other and they're going to garble the messages and R is not going to be able to tell what's going on, right? R is not going to be able to filter all that out. It's just going to look like a loud, noisy mess to R. Same as like two people talking at the same person. Now, if the network is low utilization, if A and B only are transmitting like 1% of the time. And so it's a pretty low probability event that there's ever going to be that kind of transmission collision. Eh, you could probably just have them transmit whenever. You don't care too much. If something doesn't go through, you don't get that confirmation at the end. That's all right. You try again a little later. Okay. But of course, as the network gets busier, if there's a lot more A and B nodes transmitting to R, or if A and B are transmitting more often, there's going to be a lot more interference the network traffic is going to get dominated by attempts to resend data. It'll be like a room full of people all talking at each other. But what happens when nobody can hear? They all start talking louder. And that does not make the situation better, right? It actually makes it even harder for everybody to hear. And that's the same thing that would happen. So eventually what's going to happen, a lot of that traffic is going to get backlogged, never delivered. It's awful. The network becomes useless. So the key takeaway is that last line you need to find some mechanism for sharing the network capacity. Because if you don't do it in an orderly way, the network is not going to work very well. Okay? And that's what all that binary exponential back off is about, is trying to figure out a way that uh, the different devices can effectively take trans turns to transmit under that situation. Okay. Now, again, this is not computer engineering. This is not computer science. This is IDS 200. So the big takeaway for transmission scheduling schemes is A, they exist, and B, they're used to help devices take turns transmitting so they can use the network capacity, you know, in a fairer or more efficient way, okay? Better than just everybody talking at the same time. So some general rules you tend to see, transmitters don't transmit if another device is also transmitting. I don't know why it says is transmitted. Let's fix that. Okay, is transmitting to the same receiver. Let's do that. Okay. And if there are two devices transmitting to the same receiver, they're going to do some kind of random back off before they transmit again. Now, why would they do a random back off and not a constant back off? Why would that make sense? What would be the problem with a constant time back off? Yes. And what situation would that be that we've already discussed in a different context? That would be live lock. Very good. Okay. So that's what that is, right? So if you have these two devices and they're transmitting at the same time and it's getting a collision and they both back off and wait precisely 1.234 seconds before transmitting again, 
what's going to happen? Their transmissions are going to interfere with each other again, right? And that's live lock. The system is trying to deal with the situation by doing a back off, but unfortunately, the way it's doing the back off is poorly structured and is never going to be resolved. Okay. So, yeah. Anyway, in the binary exponential back off, again, this is a tip, fairly typical one, these delays tend to be longer, so the network adapts to being busier, right? If you only have a few nodes in the network and they're intermittently transmitting, chances are, if you back off once, the recipient will be ready to hear your message next time, right? But if there's a bunch of devices and they're all transmitting, your back off times are going to have to be longer. So you're not going to check in constantly. You're going to check in every now and then and get longer and longer and longer delays. And eventually you'll get your chance and it's going to be a fairly efficient usage of network capacity. Now, having said that, there's all sorts of other different transmission scheduling schemes. You can optimize it for different things like number one, delivering data faster, right? Minimizing average delays or minimizing the risk of interference. You can come up with some fairly complex scheme for saying, you know, this batch of nodes is only going to transmit at certain times and this other batch is only going to transmit at other times. And we know if they all follow that scheme, there's not going to be interference there. Uh, a lot of times that tends to be built around the idea that the devices aren't moving around much. So you know who's part of what groups. Uh, other things like you could have a remote installation of these mobile devices, like suppose you're tracking some, uh, you know, some climate properties, like you've got some devices uh, like tracking wildlife or tracking how a glacier melts, stuff like that. And it's way in the middle of nowhere and you want to leave these devices out there for like a year. So it becomes very important to extend battery life, right? You don't want to have these devices transmitting all the time. Uh, or other schemes for ensuring equal participation by users, right? So making sure that even though when the network gets busy, maybe people can't push through all the data they want to push through, but at least everybody gets a chance to push through some data. So anyway, key, key points, transmission scheduling schemes exist and they're used to more efficiently, effectively, whatever, share the network capacity. Okay. Next thing. Video problems, all right? So we got latency, we got jitter, we got packet loss. And I'm gonna talk about all of those things, but latency is just the transmission delay, right? The delay between when you send out a request to the server and how long it takes you to get the response. And you've all, you know, anybody who's played online video games, you've experienced a day where things have been kind of busy and you say, wow, there's a lot of lag today, right? Lag is latency. Jitter, is variability in latency, right? So latency, there's always a certain amount of, uh, there's always a certain amount of delay because electrons don't teleport to the other side of the world or the continent or whatever. They gotta travel back and forth over lines and they gotta get handled by routers and switches and other equipment. And all that takes a little time. And the typical numbers you see for latency are about one millisecond per hundred miles at a minimum. Okay, I think the last time I looked up my ping on Fortnite, uh, it was in somewhere in Rust Belt, Ohio, so probably, you know, a couple hundred miles away, maybe 300, and my ping was like 15 or 20 milliseconds. So not all of that is, you know, from the cable. Some of that's from, you know, their hardware over there too, but it could be longer. Like, there was a window about, uh, about 15 years ago. My wife and I got really into playing this uh, stupid Facebook game, Tetris Battle, over a weekend. You guys know Tetris, right? You got the bricks and, you, and anyway, well, Tetris battle, you're going head to head against some other dude. And every time you clear a row on your side, it adds a row to their side. So what you try to do is build up, you know, stacks of four rows and then drop the, uh, the one by fours, the, the long sticks, and drop them in and you like slam the other guy with four or eight rows and, you know, wreck his day. So Anyway, with this game, they try to do some kind of skill-based matchmaking. So they track your levels and you go from one to 25 and you generally get paired up with people at the same level. Now me, I would always, I'd get up to like level 24 and I'd win games at level 24, creep over into level 25, and then usually very quickly get smacked down to level 24. And I thought this is strange. I mean, not strange that I'm getting smacked down because whatever, you know, I, I'm not a teenager anymore, but all the dudes that I was playing against at level 25, they all had Korean names. And I thought, how odd. Is there something special about Koreans that lets them be faster than me? And I said, no, that's crazy. Got to be something else. And so I thought, oh, well, the servers are probably located over in Korea. And in fact, I looked it up and yeah, the servers were over there in Korea. So everybody I was playing against 
you know, probably got like about a tenth of a second bonus reaction time versus me, which, you know, for stuff like that is pretty significant. Anyway, so yeah, that happens. Anyway, let, let's talk. Let's do some stuff with latency. What? Okay. So we are going to give a very simple network architecture here. There is a server and the connection goes to a switch and that switch goes out to two users to start, okay? So we have user one and we have user two. Okay, with me so far. Okay, now all this cable, we're going to assume for purposes of our discussion, all this cable takes one, can supply one gigabit per second data rate, okay? First thing for latency. Suppose that user one is what? User one is, oh, is requesting 0 0.6 gigabits per second from the server, okay? Can the server handle that? Does it look like it can? Yeah. Because all those cables can supply one gigabit per second, right? And you know that the hardware, all that RAM stuff is going to be faster. So nothing to worry about there, right? The bottleneck is going to be the cables. Okay. But then suppose user two joins and also requests 0 0.6 gigabits per second from the server. Can the server handle that? Why not? Yeah, so the total requirements, total requirements are 1.2 gigabits per second, which is greater than system capacity. So what happens? Well, if user one and user two are considered to be equal priority users, what would probably happen both user one and user two would get about 0.5 gigabits per second, meaning all operations would take about 20% longer than usual. Okay, so they want, one, they want 0.6 gigabits per second, they're only getting 0.5, whatever that means in terms of how their application is running, they're not getting their data at full speed, they're going to experience that as latency. And you can see if you add on more users with equal priority, it's going to be the same problem, right? The problem is going to get worse, that each of those users is only going to get a fraction of that one gigabit per second that's available. And that's how latency arises. This is how come when, you know, you go play Fortnite on the first day of the season and it's totally packed and everything's slow, it's like this, right? This is why. This is latency. Does that make sense? Would you like to know more? Yeah. Oh, uh, that would be network policy. So system, something like YouTube, right? If we're all just ordinary users showing up, YouTube's going to be like, I don't know you from me, you know, whatever. You guys, you're here, you get it. But there could be uh, different processes with uh, varying degrees of importance. One of the things that routers do will typically be designed to prioritize certain applications over others. Uh, for example, if there's an email application, chances are that's going to be lower priority than, say, a live streaming video application like Zoom, right? Because you don't want to have too much latency in Zoom. Otherwise, it looks like, you know, one of those badly dubbed movies. Yeah. Okay. So stuff like that is, is why. Okay. But there could be, like, administrative access issues as well. All right. So that's latency. Now, next thing, jitter. Remember, jitter is variability in latency. So for that, we're going to bring in another guy. We're going to bring in user three. And user three is super important. I don't know if you've heard. User three is super important. And I can type, what the fuck? User three, high priority. Okay. So that's good. Now, with Jitter, 
suppose both user one and user two are happily using the network with 0 0.4 gigabits per second uh, requirements each. Okay, no problem. 0 0.4 plus 0 0.4 equals 0 0.8 gigabits per second. The network can handle this. Okay, so they're just cruising along. They're doing their thing. They're happy. But suddenly user three shows up and wants to use 0 0.8 gigabits per second for a while. What will happen then? Well, remember, user three is high priority. User three gets that 0.8 gigabits per second, leaving only 0 0.2 gigabits per second for all other users. So user one and user two only get 0.1 gigabits per second each. Okay. Now, if this is a long-term persistent thing, if user three is there like all day doing this, users one and two are going to experience this as latency. But if user three pops in for a second, does this high priority stuff, goes away, pops back in a minute later, does this high priority stuff, you know, that's going to be jitter, right? So if user three is inter intermittently participating, it will cause jitter, okay? Because jitter is that variability latency. And again, jitter typically happens, you know, it could happen if you have a large and fluctuating group of users or processes, but that's unusual. More often it happens from intermittent participation of a high priority user or process that crowds out the other action. I mean, if you think about uh, some online thing like YouTube, they might have 100 people connected to a server at any given time. It's pretty unlikely that suddenly 99 people will drop off of that server or like 99 people will drop in and get instantly assigned to that server. So jitter is pretty unlikely in that case, right? It tends to be more of a slow drift, uh, but this kind of high priority situation that, that can cause it. Is that good? Would you like to know more? So that's jitter. Weird fact, I used to teach IDS 520. I taught the uh, network infrastructure model for that. And I would talk about latency and jitter there. And I swear, half to two thirds of the students in that class, they somehow looked up the definition of jitter online because they didn't listen to the, the definition I gave or you know they weren't in class or whatever. Uh, but they didn't listen to the definition and they always said, well, jitter is like some kind of variation in the signal itself. Like if the signal is supposed to be coming out at frequency X, but it could be anywhere between 1.001 X to 0.999 X, they were talking about that, but that's not what I meant when I said jitter. Anyway, don't, don't you guys do that, right? The, the jitter I talk about here is the one I mean. Okay, last one, packet loss. Okay, packet loss is pretty self-explanatory, means some packets don't arrive, right? The way that happens, some packets get backlogged and time out, and uh, in many cases, the sender will not resend them. So let's see how that can happen. Okay. So I'm going to introduce another system. And introduce this. Server two. I guess you're server one now. Okay, and same thing, these cables are all still one gigabit per second. Okay, so let's talk about packet loss. Suppose users one and two are happily, happying, happily using the system at 0.2 gigabits per second each. Okay, plenty of capacity, no problem. Uh, and from server one. Okay, so we're going to draw that. We're going to draw these two lines, user one, user two. They're both getting some low intensity interaction from server one. Dun, dun, dun. And, ah. and dun, dun, dun. okay, all right, so that's what's going on there. 
and suddenly, but then user three shows up and requests a continuous all one gigabit per second feed for a while. Well, what happens then? This switch could potentially be rated to only deal with one gigabit per second, right? It might have its own capacity issue. So, because you say, well, yeah, this cable could handle that much. I don't want to do this. Imagine at that point, these, uh, these packets, right? So three shows up, it's going to crowd out everybody. The switch gets overloaded, right? Because basically the full traffic, all this, all that this switch can handle is coming down this line and going out this other line. So what's going to happen is blue packets, they wait. And the switch is going to have some associated memory that, you know, packets that can't transmit right away might just sit there in queue waiting to go out. But if there's never a chance to send them out because the switch is always already fully busy operating, you know, this, uh, this green traffic stream, what's going to happen? Eventually they're going to time out, right? That's all there is. Or you could have other things. I mean, there's other ways it could play out too, but that's fine. So for example, suppose user three is requesting one gigabit per second from both server one and server two but it can't all be transmitted. So even if the switch has plenty of capacity, you can only send one gigabit per second down this line, but you're trying to create request two gigabits per second total. So again, there's gonna be a backlog at the switch. More packets are gonna pile up at the switch than can be forward out down this line. At some point, the switch's memory will be full. And at that point, a new packet arriving will either have to push an old one out of memory to be stored or it will just get thrown away. The system will say, nope, sorry, we don't have uh, memory to hand, handle you, so we're just going to throw it away. And that's how packets can get lost. Okay, so again, obviously for the exam, I am not going to require you to, you know, go through the detail of how all this stuff can happen, but, you know, be able to understand what latency is, what jitter is, what packet loss is, and some likely uh, possibilities for how they might arise. If you can understand all that, I'm sure you'll do fine with any questions you see. Okay. Okay, moving on. Next thing, buffering. So we've accepted that latency and jitter are serious problems. Buffering is a technique that video streaming uses to deal with that. And what buffering is, the application builds up a reserve of data. So it holds more data than it immediately needs to run the application, to play the video. And there's two basic trade-offs there. Uh, one is that if you, have a, if you have a longer buffer, right, stores more data, you're gonna have more reliable operation for your video, right? If you have a minute of stored data, then you have basically a minute safety margin for anything to go wrong in the network. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a shorter buffer, yeah, you don't have as much of a safety margin, but you can immediately start playing your video, right? Because if you're going to say, I'm not going to start playing this video until I get, you know, a full minute of data, well, it's going to take a second. Uh, and basically buffering addresses these kind of uh, streaming problems. If you hold a bunch of data, if there's a latency problem, so I'm going to go do a video. We'll find some sidewalk cops. This is what we used to watch with our kids. Uh, sidewalk cops. Dun, dun, dun. Oh yeah, so litter bug, this is a classic. It'll be done in a second. Ooh, I get to skip both, how nice. All right. So this is stuff we used to watch this with our uh, kids in the early days of, you know, watching stuff with our kids. Anyway, you look down here, this is the play bar, right? And see that little extra gray uh, line there? That's the buffer, right? And so right now we're at what, six seconds in and we have the buffer till about 34 seconds in. So we got almost 30 seconds of, uh, of bonus time. What that means is if every packet down, you know, that we don't have yet takes 30 seconds to arrive, we can still play the video basically continuously, right? Because we have that much of a buffer built in. 
Uh, likewise, if I have a temporary disconnect from the system, from the network, and it lasts less than 30 seconds, the user is never going to experience that. This morning, I uh, actually disconnected the wireless for a minute and then brought it back, and the video keeps on, you know, playing happily along because of the buffer, right? But I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this today because we're a little pressed for time. Okay. Oh, look, and we got some more buffer now. It's up to like a full minute now, and it keeps bringing it in. And we got a minute and a half. All right, that's what buffering is. So again, if you have the buffered data, you already have it stored. You can keep continuously playing the video, even if there are these problems. If there's latency, packets are taking a long time to arrive, or if there's jitter and like an individual packet or cluster of packets takes a really long time to arrive. Even if packet loss, right? Like for example, you've disconnected from the network even if there's packet loss like that, they get a chance to get resent. Okay. All righty. Now, quality of service metrics. So we're into the measurement portion of things. So quality of service inherently means different things to different users of different applications, right? Just like big data, it's not a single monolithic variable. I mean, people talk about big data problems and they talk about quality of service problems. And they talk in the commercials like, our quality of service is top notch. It's the best in North America, right? So yeah, for advertising purposes or for some high level you know, presentation, sure, you might like give it some code as our quality of service is green for super good or yellow for so-so or red for bad, right? But you, know, you can break it down into all these different things, right? There's latency, there's jitter, there's total packet throughput, how, many, how much data you can push over the network things like that, right? So there are a bunch of different aspects to quality of service. Now you can also consider quality of service, not just in raw absolute performance, like how much data you can push through with what probability of success. You can also consider it in terms of, is it satisfactory for the application? And this is a lot like how quality, uh, you know, the quality arguments that you see in the industrial uh, arena, I guess, that if you are, suppose you're making watches, and you have the option to make watches out of stainless steel or gold. Would you say a watch made out of gold or stainless steel would probably be higher quality? Well, it really depends, doesn't it? If the user is interested in cachet, then you would say almost certainly the gold watch has higher cachet, right? If you're interested in resistance to abrasions and scratches, well, gold's pretty soft, right? You can scratch it with just about anything. If you're interested in how well the watches tell time, there's no difference, right? They're both watches. It doesn't matter if the case is gold or steel. So what I'm saying is however you're looking at this in terms of quality, if it's sufficient for the application, you have to understand what the users expect from the application and then make sure that it's being delivered, right? So again, if you're talking about some real-time first-person shooter game, yeah, quality of service has to be super high, right? You have to get a lot of packets fast. There can't be pauses or delays, all that, right? But if you're talking about email, it has to get there eventually, right? It has to be correct and complete. And if it takes a little while, yeah, that's okay. Faster is nice, but, right? The main thing is that it gets there with, you know, pretty quick. Okay. Anyway. A lot of networks in the real world experience significant and transient bursts of heavy traffic, right? There'll be a little burst of activity for a while and then another little burst of activity. And this is, again, that kind of peak to average traffic ratio we talked about when we were talking about with Amazon's cloud service back when. So if you're having these bursts of traffic, uh, basically you can get quick drops in quality of service due to network congestion, right? And any network can experience this, even Amazon, that most of the time they have a tremendous amount of capacity available, uh, way more than they need. But for Amazon Prime Day, on occasion, right, there's not enough because it's super busy. So if you want your network to be uh, robust and reliable, basically to not fail or to have its performance uh, degrade gracefully, uh, make sure that everybody can do some of the stuff they wanna do, you gotta plan them around meeting peak demand instead of just the average, right? You kind of look at the worst case scenario and you say, well, how is our network going to do that? Uh, and in fact, this was a big thing back when with the transition to mobile devices in the workplace. So a lot of these uh, organizations, they would experience really big uh, bursts of traffic, like first thing in the morning when everybody turns on their mobile devices, 
and you know they get their software updates all at the same time and they're all clustered in the same place because they're all going through the front doors of the building and they get the thing when people go out to lunch and when they come back and they get the same thing when uh, you know at the end of the day when everybody's leaving uh, it even happens recently within the last year our family was staying at some hotel i, I don't remember where it's probably in wisconsin and every morning at eight in the morning Literally, it took like three to five minutes to connect to the hotel Wi-Fi. I'm not sure what was going on there. If it was just like a lot of people doing stuff or the system itself was kind of rebooting, resetting, whatever. But there was always this window, like first thing in the morning, where the hotel Wi-Fi was super, super slow and you kind of couldn't do anything. So, yeah, it does happen in the real world. Anyway, <clears throat> when you're having these kind of QoS shortfalls, Questions you can ask is because there's often a cost benefit aspect to how much capacity you want to put in, right? The solution is always to massively over provision capacity, right? Put in a lot more cable and other capacity than you actually need. And that way you ensure that you can deal with peak demand. But of course that stuff is expensive and you do have to put a lid on it somewhere. You got to say, okay, enough is enough. This is all we have in the budget. So you might ask questions like how many users get affected? What portion of network traffic is affected? what fraction of the day is affected. So if it's a very short transient burst that you know affects a relatively small number of users, you might decide to live with that, right? At some point you say, yeah, we're gonna keep enough data so the situation doesn't get too bad, enough capacity so the situation doesn't get too bad, but we're not gonna make sure in that little tiny window that everybody can do everything they wanna do. Even Amazon, on Prime Day, their systems can get a little congested because if Amazon massively over provisions capacity relative to its Prime Day requirements, that's a lot of money they're spending the whole year round, right? And they've just decided that ah, not gonna not gonna do that. Anyway, okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So ideally, a video streaming application gets every whole frame in time to be shown, right? Basically, it gets one chunk of the data as soon as it's done playing the first chunk, it has the next chunk ready to show. But for human viewers, uh, different delivery problems get perceived differently, right? So one thing, humans can't perceive a frame rate much higher than 24 to 30 frames per second. If the frame rate is a lot higher and there's a missing frame here or there, humans aren't really going to notice that. And so in many cases, it's a perfectly fine solution to say, yeah, this video we'd like to show it at a very high frame rate, but if the connection quality drops, you might cut back on that without sacrificing too much in terms of user happiness. Uh, same thing for video quality, right? You'd ideally like to show every frame of the video in super high quality, but in most cases, it's more important to keep playing the video and accept you know, some slight degradation in uh, video quality. But of course, latency and jitter, if they extend past where the buffer is, then the users are definitely gonna notice that because the video is gonna stop playing for a second, right? You never want that to happen. Now. Interestingly, YouTube primarily does not use what you might consider to be the more technically perfect option. So we'll, we'll talk. Okay, so TCP, we've mentioned before, basically a transport protocol for how uh, packets are going to be handled versus UDP is the alternative, right? These are the two big communication models. As far as ordinary user data being sent over the internet, TCP is about 95%, UDP is about 5%, if you want an idea. So the vast majority of data sent over the internet is over TCP. Uh, and TCP is connection-based. What it does, essentially it creates a source to destination path, allowing data to arrive in the proper sequence, right? So when it wants to send out a message from one device to another, it first builds that routing path, and then it sends the packets out one after another along that same path along that same path, right? And that makes sure that the data can arrive in the proper sequence, which is good if you're playing a video, you want the data to arrive in the proper sequence so that you can start playing the next segment as soon as the previous one finishes. TCP also provides some guarantees about packet delivery. When we say guarantee, we don't mean that a packet is guaranteed to be delivered, right? If you're sending a message and some router in the middle of the routing path catches fire, you can't go through that router anymore, right? That particular path is going to be unusable. You'll have to do something to fix it, right? When we say guarantees, we mean if there's some temporary hiccup, it's gonna try again a few times before it gives up, right? Just like we talked about that uh, binary exponential backoff algorithm. If for some reason, one of the devices along the path is busy at that instant, 
it gonna keep it's gonna keep trying to send the message over and over until it finally times out and gives up. Okay. UDP, on the other hand, UDP is connectionless. Whatever kind of set of packets you're sending out, they're not guaranteed to arrive in order. They're not guaranteed to be sent over the same path. Every packet gets sent out basically according to the best path available at that particular instant. So for a message that contains a million packets, if the network is kind of changeable, then yeah, some of the packets are probably gonna get sent over different paths. But if the network is kind of boring and quiet, then they might very well all go down the same path. The other thing about UDP, there are no delivery guarantees. Any lost packets don't get resent. So it's kind of a fire and forget protocol. Okay. So if you're gonna compare those two, here's the key takeaway. TCP is slower than UDP. There's that same kind of handshake that we saw with the binary exponential back off where you check if the device is ready to receive your packet, the device confirms that it's ready, then you send the packet, then the reci recipient sends back the confirmation that it got it. That kind of handshake slows things down a bit, okay? With UDP, the sender is just gonna send it and hope the receiver gets it, right? There's no kind of checking there. So if the network is safe and reliable and there's not a whole lot of scope for things to go wrong, UT UDP is going to be a lot faster. Uh, the other thing, if there is a problem, TCP is going to take a while before it realizes there's a problem. Because remember, it's going to do that kind of back off scheme. It's going to retransmit a few times until finally it gives up and says, oh, I guess I can't deliver this thing. But that could take several seconds or longer, you know, to verify that, in fact, yeah, this packet isn't getting through. Okay, and at that point, you try to uh, resolve it by finding a new path. So UDP, on the other hand, less reliable than TCP because it's fire and forget. If you send out a message, a packet, and the recipient doesn't get it, oh, there's no uh, there's no mechanism inherent to UDP to make sure that a packet gets resent. So real-time streaming, true real-time streaming, probably is going to use UDP because why? Because users can't rewind the video, right? If you're watching something live and not recording it, it's like if you're driving in your car. You're driving in your car, you turn on the radio, and it's the last 15 seconds of some song you really like. Can you rewind the radio to play the whole song? Of course not, right? Not with the radio, because it's just not there, right? That moment is lost. So conceptually, UDP is like listening to the radio in your car. Uh, also applicable to real-time video games, right? If you're in some you know, complex build battle with somebody and you're doing this or that, and you don't want your network to be trying to send you data from five or 10 seconds ago when you might have cared, right? You just want, just send me the current status now. Anything from far back is useless to me. I don't need to know about what the, sta what the state was from then. Okay, but UDP uses TCP for a couple reasons. Number one, YouTube isn't true real-time streaming. In fact, videos are broken into segments and YouTube sends you the segments once, one at a time like partial files. The other, the bigger thing, some systems can block UDP, right? If you have a regular uh, firewall, one of the things that the firewall looks at or your router looks at, if you send a message to, UD, uh, to YouTube saying, hey, please send me this video, the router remembers that you launched that request. And so when YouTube sends you back the stream of packets corresponding to that, the router's like, oh, great, yes, we expected that. The user launched a request, now we're getting the response great, this is fine, I'm gonna let this through. But if it's UDP, number one, the packets don't really have a sequence. You know, you could put a sequence on them, but they could arrive out of sequence and they could arrive from del different delivery paths. And it's really hard for those kind of automated security tools like firewalls to be entirely sure that it's all legit traffic and not some uh, outside source trying to install malware on your machine, right? So what can happen is that the firewalls can uh, err on the side of caution and block that kind of traffic. So YouTube said, you know what, even though maybe technically it would make sense to use UDP for this video streaming, we're not gonna do it because you know the firewalls might block half the users on earth from using YouTube and you know that's not gonna be good for our business model. Okay, so YouTube uh, pretty much uses TCP. Now, there's another one called Quick. Google has developed the Quick protocol for its internal use. And basically, it tries to find that happy medium combining UDP and TCP. Uh, anyway, the, the gist of Quick is that 
if everything is arriving safely, if all your packets are arriving safely, then UDP is great because it's faster, right? And in fact, most of the time on modern networks, you don't have problems and most or all of the packets do arrive safely. So Google figured out, you know, we, if we have some big file that we want to send or some long sequence of data, whatever, we can break it into chunks sent over UDP, right? We can send out these long chunks of UDP data and the vast majority of them should arrive safely. And even if a couple have to be resent because the application that receives them gets to assemble them at the end. And if it doesn't have all of them, it's going to send a request saying, hey, yeah, I need this one. The vast majority of times, all the streams are going to get there correctly. And so it benefits from the speed of UDP. But it implements some of the recovery mechanisms from TCP to combine that. Anyway, this is an internal thing with uh, Google. So, you know, it, mostly it works pretty well for them. I'm not entirely sure you'd want to use it over the internet as a whole, but it works pretty well internally for Google. Anyway, uh, the other, the fallback, if there's a system that blocks UDP for whatever reason, can't use it, then Quick automatically defaults to TCP. And so it gets around that problem as well. But basically, Quick is a combination of the speed of UDP. It's not quite as fast as straight UDP, but it does have a recovery mechanism built in, and that's something. Okay. Now, the way YouTube sends videos in segments is it uses a protocol called DASH. So DASH stands for Dynamic Adaptive Streaming over HTTP. And the whole idea of DASH is that it wants to adapt the quality of the video segments it gives you according to your current connection quality. So we've probably all experienced this where you're standing right next to the router watching a video and then you walk away somewhere like into a basement or you know in a bathroom or something and you're behind a bunch of walls and you're separated from the router and suddenly your connection quality drops a lot and the video goes from looking great to looking all like you know blocky and pixelicious. Yeah, that's basically what Dash is doing. But the point is the video keeps playing. Right? It keeps playing the best it can with these lower quality video segments. So what YouTube wants to do with Dash is dynamically set, uh, select video quality segments during transmission based on how much buffer capacity you have and what your current connection quality is. Okay, So the idea is it's going to try to send you the highest quality segment that you can process without actually cutting into the buffer too much. All right, so the way this happens, I got... Yeah, I got to do this. There we go. Okay, so we're going to draw, we're going to draw a picture. So this is our data rate on our connection. Connection data rate, more is better. And this is time. Okay, and we're walking along. At first, our video quality, you know, our connection is great. Eventually, it drops. It stays bad for a while. Eventually, it goes back up to where it was, and then it keeps on going happily along. Okay? So, we're going to further assume YouTube has a video, uh, has video segments encoded into five different degrees of quality. So, YouTube has highest, high, medium, low, lowest quality, okay? And we're gonna draw some uh, data chunks for that. So highest quality requires a lot more data, okay? High requires less, medium requires quite a bit less, low requires less than that, and lowest requires not much at all, okay? So at first, you have uh, a good buffer and you know you have plenty of, uh, data you can send. So the first segments you get, get look like this, right? YouTube keeps on sending these nice, big, high quality uh, data chunks. And if at first when the connection starts to dip, YouTube might still send you those same high chunks, right? Because you still have plenty of buffer and YouTube will be like, yeah, this is okay. But at some point, YouTube's going to notice, oh, the buffer is getting depleted. Your connection speed isn't that great. We're going to drop this to medium. And if the connection keeps on getting worse, you might eventually get dropped to lower and eventually lowest quality. Okay, move.
All right, and at some point you're gonna, you know, just sit there with these low quality segments and your video is gonna look all blocky and chunky. But as the connection continues to improve, you're gonna build up more buffer, right? And eventually YouTube is gonna say, oh, we got plenty of buffer along again. Now we can start sending, we can start sending a little better segment, right? We can send better quality. And we're gonna send that and maybe send the next highest quality at some point, right? And then send the next highest quality eventually when our connection is good and stable and our buffer is built up. So that's basically the way that Dash is gonna work. Okay. I know we got four minutes and a few slides. We're gonna go through the rest of these. So that's the, uh, you know, again, that's the stuff I covered there. Dash is what's called an open source protocol. So source code is the code that the humans can read. And so anything that's written by humans is the source code. Uh, there's two models for that. One is closed source. Closed source is where it's like hidden behind closed doors. It's not accessible to the public. It's proprietary, right? So for example, Microsoft Excel, you can't go in and see the source code for Excel, although it is possible potentially to design add-ins or other you know, sort of modules that work along with it. And the way Microsoft makes money off of that model is they sell it. You know, you used to be able to just go into a store and buy a copy of Excel, or they sell licenses. Like U of I probably has like a 10,000 machine, 10,000 copy license for Microsoft Excel. That's how they make money. The open source model, software isn't really owned by anyone. Like for example, the Linux operating system, and it can be developed or modified by anyone. You could get the source code, modify it, modify it somehow for your own personal use or you can join some big open source coding project where people work together to make the next generation of Linux. And because you know any individual person isn't doing most of the work, right? They're piggybacking off all the other people that design the open source code libraries that are already there. You, part of the licensing model is that you can't charge for it, right? So the only way to really get revenue for that is for things like training and tech support that you can offer along with it which there was the organization that developed Linux, in fact, did that. Now, 20 years ago, there was like, this all was kind of new, and there were a lot of computer people that were really excited about it. Open source code certainly has its place, but I think some of those guys really oversold uh, the idea of how much of an impact it would make on the world. Uh, but one of the things that was true is it generally had better uh, security than closed source code. And the idea there is if it's open source code, even though everybody can see the source code and potentially spot vulnerabilities, the fact that you have a large bunch of people looking at it over a long extended window of time means that you can probably spot those uh, flaws before the bad guys do, before it's fully implemented, right? So there was that. But it's not a metaphysical certitude. There is, you know, open source code can have vulnerabilities too. All right, the last few slides here are just about uh, net, uh, YouTube system architecture. So big picture with YouTube, they deal with a lot of the same problems Facebook does. Facebook has you know exabytes of image data. YouTube has exabytes of video data. Facebook wants to send out data bundled together as albums because it's faster. YouTube can kind of do the same thing with videos, right? Each, uh, each segment of a video is kind of comparable to a Facebook album. And they do the same thing as far as where data is stored. They like to store data where it's locally relevant again so they can deliver it faster and not have to store copies of everything all over the world. Okay. So yeah, this is the same kind of thing. Just like Facebook, you upload a photo once, you can't edit it once it's already uploaded. You could delete it, edit it at home and upload a new copy, but you can't edit the photo in place and you can't run these big queries across tables. Same kind of thing at YouTube, right? There are certain queries you can do to look for particular kinds of videos. You might look for all the videos linked to one particular person or all videos with a particular artist, but you're not gonna be able to run queries on YouTube system like show me all visitor, all videos posted by people in Chicago in the month of October, 2022, right? That's not a query you can run on their system. Same thing like videos on YouTube, you can't edit them once they're in place, right? You can upload the data, it's there. If you want to change it, you can delete it, hide it, whatever, upload a new copy, but it's basically read only. Now, last thing, uh, way back when, 10 years ago or so, YouTube was super secretive about a lot of things of their operation. And so there was a wave of academic papers where people were saying, well, let's figure out what we can based on looking at the packets that are sent. 
And a couple of these were people that said, let's see if this is true, right? It makes sense that YouTube would store videos at data centers based primarily on language, for example. So if you had a music video that was in Finnish, chances are it would be stored at some data center near Finland and not stored locally in the US because basically nobody here in the US, hardly anyone speaks Finnish. So, and they actually did that. They like logged onto this uh, YouTube and watched a bunch of videos and looked at all the packet data. And they said, yeah, you know what? We can verify, in fact, this is the way YouTube does it, basically same as Facebook. Okay, that's all I got. We'll have a new lecture on Tuesday. I hope everyone has a good weekend. We'll see you next time. Okay. About the open source versus the closed source. Okay. Which one is more secure, would you say? Uh,